On this Saturday night, dealing with delays at Canada's airports. Ottawa suspends random COVID-19 testing for some passengers. This is like tinkering at best. Will it make a difference? Demanding gun control. Thousands rally across the U.S. for firearms reform as Uvalde's school district police chief defends his delay in confronting a mass shooter. He said that was a conscious decision. Canada's commitments. What Prime Minister Trudeau agreed to at the Summit of the Americas. And discovering a different sound. An Alberta program helps trans and gender diverse people find their voice. I have more tools to be able to make my voice sound more like darker or more masculine. Global National, reporting tonight, Eric Sorensen. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. We begin with breaking news out of Ottawa, where Parliament Hill has reopened after a threat investigation shut down the area for hours. A public safety source tells Global News police received information that raised concerns about possible credible threats from explosives near Parliament Hill. MPs and senators were told to shelter in place during the investigation. Multiple sources say there have been arrests. It's not clear how many people or why. Ottawa police say now the incident is over. Just four months ago, protesters occupied the streets around Parliament Hill for several weeks. As of today, fully vaccinated travelers arriving at Canada's airports will no longer face mandatory random COVID-19 testing. The federal government says it's a temporary move to help eliminate the bottlenecks at major airports across the country. But as Morgan Campbell reports, critics say more needs to be done. Even if you don't travel, it's likely you have seen social media footage or heard of long lineups and delays at major airports across Canada, particularly Pearson International Airports. I'm here four hours prior to my departure, but better, you know, Early than sorry. Friday, the federal government suspended randomized testing of fully vaccinated air passengers from Saturday until July 1st to reduce wait times. But there is concern the move won't actually alleviate much of the pressure felt here at Canada's largest airports. In May, nearly half a million passengers faced delays on returning international flights here at Pearson, which equates to about half of all arrivals from abroad. It doesn't really seem to me to, to, to control anything. The big, the big issue, the big slowdown has been at security and at customs and this doesn't have to do anything to do with either one of those. As of July 1st, unvaccinated travelers will be tested off-site which could cause more delays. But the feds still believe randomized testing is important and some experts agree. And there obviously has to be a balance of acquiring that information and of course not inconveniencing the general population. The federal government has also hired more than 860 screening officers across the country. The CBSA has also added more staff. Meanwhile, Canada's travel industry has been lobbying the federal government and its U.S. counterparts to remove testing on both sides of the border, saying such measures are having a negative impact on tourism and keeping international visitors away. It it is possible Canada could see an influx of travelers from the U.S. as the Biden administration begins dropping pre-departure tests for people flying into America. Most of the people are kind of scared of getting tested and then waiting for the results. People have been waiting for this. U.S. restrictions will be lifted Sunday. Morgan Campbell, Global News, Pearson International Airport. Ontario is lifting nearly all of its remaining COVID-19 mask mandates today. People are no longer required to wear masks on public transit and in most health care settings. Many hospitals across the province are keeping the rules in place for visitors and staff. Mask mandates will also remain in Ontario's long-term care and retirement homes. Public health officials in Toronto are stepping up efforts to stop monkeypox from spreading. The city will hold vaccination clinics for high-risk individuals starting tomorrow. The program will offer protection to those who've had close contact with known cases and those at higher risk of being exposed to the virus. Employees of local bathhouses will be immunized first. Several clinics will follow in the coming weeks. There are now 11 confirmed cases in Toronto and more than 100 across the country. 
Hundreds of thousands of Americans are demanding new gun laws as March for Our Lives rallies were held from coast to coast. The first March for Our Lives was held four years ago after the mass shooting at a high school in Parkland, Florida. As Jennifer Johnson reports, the latest massacres in Buffalo and Uvalde have activists demanding action on gun control again. No more silence and gun violence! From Brooklyn, New York, to Washington, D.C., and dozens of other cities across America, hundreds of thousands of protesters sent one clear message to lawmakers. Bye. Your inaction Bye. is killing Americans. This is not a political issue. This is a moral issue. Nowhere in the Constitution is unrestricted access to weapons of war a guaranteed right. In Parkland, Florida, where high school students first started this movement, there were fiery speeches. Years after the massacre there, mass shootings in the U.S. continue to leave communities shattered. People say that most movements take a long time until change is made. But 10 years since the Sandy Hook shooting, and four years since the Parkland shooting seems like a pretty long damn time to me. The yeas are 223. This week, the House passed bills that would raise the age to buy a semi-automatic gun to 21, ban high-capacity magazines, and allow judges to confiscate weapons from anyone deemed dangerous. But that package has little chance of passing the Senate, where 10 Republicans would have to join Democrats. A different bipartisan bill is now being worked on. I'm not interested in doing something unless that something is going to save lives. There have already been over 250 mass shootings in America so far this year, yet no major federal gun control legislation has passed Congress since 1994. Polls show most Americans have had enough, including teachers in Texas. Over the course of the year, we will be expected to interrupt our school day to conduct lockdown drills to show the children what it will feel like to be hunted by a gunman intent on murdering them. Gun control advocates vow to keep the pressure on lawmakers and not allow the passage of time to lead to nothing getting passed in Congress again. Gun control. Activists hope after so much bloodshed in America, something will finally change. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. On the heels of today's rallies, the police chief of the school district in Uvalde, Texas, is speaking publicly for the first time. Pete Arredondo told the Texas Tribune he didn't have his police radios because he thought they would slow him down and he needed both hands free. He said that was a conscious decision. He rushed in there, put both of his hands on his gun because he was taught that that was the, um, that was the most accurate way to attack the, the shooter if he ran into him. When the police chief did locate the shooter in a classroom, he said the door was locked and he had to try dozens of keys before he was able to get in and rescue the children who were still alive one hour and 17 minutes after the shooting began. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is returning to Ottawa with some new agreements from the Summit of the Americas. Trudeau spent the week in Los Angeles meeting his hemispheric counterparts on issues like climate change and irregular migration. David Aiken is traveling with the Prime Minister. David, what happened? When the Summit of the Americas opened on Wednesday, it opened with a controversy over its guest list. Cuba, Venezuela and Nicaragua were not invited and Mexico sat it out in solidarity with those other three. There had been concerns that without Mexico, the summit host, U.S. President Joe Biden, would have trouble getting what he wanted in Los Angeles, a deal on irregular migration. Even as the summit opened, a caravan of thousands of migrants were tramping across Mexico towards the U.S. border. But by week's end, Biden got what he wanted. The leaders on this stage are joining together to make what, and it's, over, it's an overused phrase in international relations and public life, to make a historic commitment, because it is a historic commitment we're about to make. Canada signed on to the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection, promising to take in more refugees from the Americas and fund some border management projects in Central America and the Caribbean. There are no easy answers on this. This is a, a deep complex problem that, quite frankly, adds itself to a range of problems around the world. Trudeau says the declaration is important because 20 countries signed on to it. What was really important with the work done this week and leading up to this week was the opening of a conversation uh, with hemispheric partners. Trudeau also argued that a multilateral approach, including face-to-face -face conversations between leaders at international summits, 
is vital to helping solve global problems. The pandemic and climate change have underlined for all of us just how small the world is and how what happens elsewhere matters deeply, not just to us as governments, but to our citizens. Also while in L.A., Trudeau inked a new climate partnership with California Governor Gavin Newsom. It's one that will, among other things, see the two jurisdictions work together to find ways to reduce increasingly destructive wildfires. This Los Angeles summit was just the first of what could be a very busy month for Justin Trudeau on the international summit circuit. By the end of the month, Commonwealth leaders meet in Rwanda, G7 leaders meet in Germany, and NATO leaders have a key meeting in Spain. And the Canadian Prime Minister is expected to be at all of those meetings. David Aiken, Global News, Los Angeles. Around the world, countries are under mounting pressure to take urgent action to combat climate change. U.S. President Joe Biden aims to slash his country's carbon emissions in half by 2030. That means moving towards cleaner energy more quickly. How does Canada factor in? Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson sat down with the U.S. Ambassador to Canada. Mercedes, David Cohen's recent comments about Canadian energy have sparked some controversy. Eric, U.S. Ambassador David Cohen has been feeling a bit of diplomatic heat after he made comments about Alberta's oil and gas sector that were not met with fond feelings from that province's government. When it comes to weaning off Russian oil over the conflict in Ukraine and the rising price of gas at the pumps, some hope the U.S. might look to Alberta as a solution. But Cohen was quoted in late May in the National Post, saying the U.S. was, quote, not really in the market to expand oil and gas links to Canada. Alberta's energy minister called the comments ill-informed and unproductive. I asked Ambassador Cohen about his statements, and he took a more open tone, but made it clear that fighting climate change is still a priority for President Biden. We'd always be interested in more oil and gas from Alberta or from anywhere else. But... We have to, let's go and make, let's go and define our terms. Cohen doesn't agree that Alberta's help would necessarily solve consumer pain at the pumps, and he emphasized the U.S.'s commitment to looking for new, clean energy sources. As a policy objective in the energy space, we have to be very careful about making major investments, tens of billions of dollars of investments that will produce more fossil fuels five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that will increase emissions and make it difficult or impossible to achieve the climate change targets that we need to achieve. Another hot topic for the Canada-U.S. relationship is defense spending. And while the ambassador did not overtly criticize the Canadian government on this, he did indicate that the U.S. was disappointed in the gap between the Trudeau government's public rhetoric on what they were going to spend on the military compared to what showed up in the budget. And he noted that Canada is still a ways off from reaching that NATO 2% spending target. Canada, though, in making those assessments, did pledge in the Wales commitments to move its defense spending um, to 2% of GDP. Um, this spending does not do that. There's a report that was released um, this week that um, predicts that at, on its current trajectory, Canada won't get to 2% over, over a five-year period. But the report notes that Canada will move closer to the 2% level. I also asked the ambassador about the biggest threats to democracy in both Canada and the United States. We'll have more on the West Bloc on Sunday. Eric? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa for us tonight. Thank you, Mercedes. Coming up, why people who experienced hate incidents during the pandemic rarely reported them. As we've reported many times during the pandemic, hate crimes are on the rise. Now, a new survey confirms it, and that many people say they didn't bother reporting the incidents. BC's Human Rights Commissioner says it's time for better strategies to fight hate. Camille Karamali has more. It's been more than two years since Trixie Ling's brush with anti-Asian hate, but even now, it's tough to forget. I see this white man approaching me, and we right walk past each other. He turned around, he spat on my face. 
and shopping malls. Now, a survey conducted by the BC Office of the Human Rights Commissioner shows people have experienced more hate during the pandemic, but few have reported it. The results showed 35% of people surveyed experienced, witnessed, or were affected by hate during the pandemic. Of those, more than half felt there was a rise of hate incidents because people were blaming certain groups for the pandemic. And out of all those who experienced hate incidents, 72% did not report it. And 68% believed reporting it would not make a difference. We know that some people don't feel that police are able to provide them uh, with the support or will treat them fairly in that process, particularly racialized people uh, might feel that way. You chose to report this to police. So why did you choose to speak up? Well, I really felt the need. If I don't do anything, he'll do this to someone else. Ling says only to find out her case had been dropped by police six months after she had reported it. Oh, that made me feel really angry. I have discouraged and angry because there's just no accountability. Police say that's likely one of the reasons why victims don't report these incidents, a lack of results. But even if reporting it doesn't lead to an arrest, police say it still provides other benefits. We need to hear about it so that we can properly track it and so we can understand what's happening in the community and so that we can properly respond to the community's needs. BC's Human Rights Commissioner says the next step is to put forward recommendations by next year to help build trust between victims of hate and the institutions that might be able to stop it. Kamal Karamali, Global News. Still ahead, the beef with some new Health Canada food labeling requirements. In the coming weeks, you may see new labels on packages of ground meat at the grocery store. Health Canada says nutrition symbols will be required on the front of packages for foods high in sodium, sugars or saturated fat. Many products will be exempt, but ground meats are not one of them. And as Troy Charles reports, it's left some in the meat industry scratching their heads. Soon, any food that contains 15% of your recommended daily intake of sodium, sugars, and saturated fat will be slapped with a front-of-package nutrition symbol. For some, the inclusion of ground meats, which are high in saturated fat, doesn't add up. Canada would be the only one that had a single ingredient product that had this warning. It just makes it make less and less sense and we think the government and the Minister of Health should reconsider. 50% of beef consumed in Canada is ground. With inflation a major issue at the grocery store, ground meat prices have remained more stable than others. When you think about protein for affordability, you're basically going to be discouraging Canadians uh, from eating these products that are still relatively affordable compared to other cuts. So you have to wonder whether or not it's the right time to do this. Charlebois added these labels can be a motivating factor for industry to innovate, to force them to research and make better products that would have had too much sodium, fats, and sugar. But what do you do with ground beef? What do you do with, with ground pork? There's nothing else you can do. Uh, it's a natural single ingredient product. Charlebois feels ground meats should be exempt from the label. In a statement, Health Canada says that exemptions occur when there is evidence that the food provides a protective effect on health. Ground beef is one of the most affordable nutrient-packed products that can help with that iron deficiency, zinc, vitamin B12, oh, and by the way, a great source of protein. Lee and Charlebois are calling on federal agencies to reconsider. Health Canada says they are not warning labels, but intended to reduce health risks as Canadians' intake of saturated fats remains above recommended limits. Troy Charles, Global News. Next, the Alberta program speaking up for trans and gender diverse people. After two years of COVID-19 restrictions, thousands packed the streets of Rome today for the return of the city's pride parade. This year's slogan, we're back to make noise, a tribute to the late gay icon, Raffaella Cata. After years of little to no government support, Rome's mayor marched in today's parade, a move described by organizers as very encouraging. 
In Alberta, a remarkable program is helping trans and gender diverse people find the voice that matches how they see themselves. It's seeing a big jump in referrals, and as Sue Ling Go reports, those in the program say it makes them feel more comfortable and confident. Parker Pottier says a trip through the drive through was once a source of stress. If I'm having a bad day and somebody says, okay, ma'am, pull up to the window, like it, it feels really deflating. Parker identifies as a non-binary transgender person. When they started transitioning a few years ago... I realized that the things I was doing to change how I looked and to change how I sounded was bringing me a lot of euphoria with my gender. And so that was when I realized like how much happier I could be. A doctor referred Parker to the Voice and Resonance program at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital. Mo. Dr. Teresa Hardy was the U of A's first practitioner and researcher of gender voice training. She helps clients set goals and work towards the voice they want, not necessarily feminine or masculine. It's like learning a musical instrument because we're learning to use the voice or the instrument in a different way. When I saw you know, who I was going to be working with and the level of expertise that she had, it, it really did surprise me that there was someone who cared enough like that. The therapy is publicly funded, but the wait time is long. Over the past decade, referrals have increased from five per year to more than five per month. It took Parker three and a half years to get in, but it was worth it. I have more tools to be able to make my voice sound more like darker or more masculine at will kind of thing, you know? And so it's, it's very... Um, freeing, I guess. Dr. Hardy says it's rewarding to help people sound more like themselves and navigate a sometimes difficult society. I've heard from numerous clients that doing this work kind of makes them feel like they have a bit of a shield against some of that marginalization or makes them feel a bit safer as they interact with the world. And for some people, it can even be life-saving. Sue Lingo, Global News. And that's Global National for this Saturday. I'm Eric Sorensen. Tonight's York Canada is Vancouver's Girl in a Wetsuit statue. The landmark turned 50 this weekend. It was unveiled in Stanley Park in 1972. We love seeing your Canada. Please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Chris Galis will be here tomorrow. Have a great night.